Let's look for a few moments in the scripture, uh, review a little bit, and I don't actually don't have a, a lot of thoughts to share with you about this, but some of the most important thoughts you could hear about or hear again, be reminded of. Psalm 133, we've been looking at for some uh, weeks now. Psalm 133 has been our text. In verse 1 it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He goes on to say, It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. It's like the dew of Hermon, the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He, and he, he connects it with uh, blessing and anointing. On the other side of it, how bad and how unpleasant it is to be in strife and to have broken fellowship and to have fights and falling out and not talk to each other for 15 years. That's bad, right? And it has happened all too often amongst church-going people and their families. I mean, you see, he's talking about brethren. Did you see that? For brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, turn with me, to, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. I wanted to just read a few verses to you today and believe that the anointing would be on them, that you'd see things that you hadn't, we hadn't seen before and see it clearer. In Ephesians 2 and 13, he said, Now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. And that, when, when you're at animosity and, and have fights and falling out, that's, that's, maybe you were close at one time, but now you're distant, far off. And it's possible to be in the same room with someone and feel like you're 100 miles away. He said, verse 14, for he, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He made peace, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances for the making himself of two, one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God. Both refers to Jew and Gentile. In one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity, so he keeps mentioning enmity, we might say animosity thereby. He came and preached peace to you that were far off and to them that were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. We were at odds with God. We were separated because of our sins and shortcomings. But the Bible said Jesus has paid the price, broke down the, the, the wall between us, and removed the animosity and enmity between us and the Father, and He has now become our peace and has reconciled. Everybody say reconciled. reconciled. He's reconciled us to God. That means to restore to friendship. Colossians 1 says it like this, Colossians 1.20. It says, having made peace through the blood of His cross, 
by him to reconcile all things to himself. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, did you hear that? To present you what? Holy. Holy. What else? Unblameable. Unblameable. What else? Unreprovable in his sight. Now, you might think, man, there's no way that's happening. I'm me, holy. I'm not me, nothing to be blamed. Me, unreprovable. Yes, because of what he has done. We were unable to accomplish this through our own efforts. We're unable to accomplish this through keeping the law. But because of what Jesus has done, we, if we'll accept what he's done by faith, and we'll agree with him, how many think if the Lord says, I've made you holy, what should you say? Huh? You, should you disagree with him and say, no, I know I'm not holy? Or should you agree with him? And it's not based on anything we did. It's based on what he did. He has made us worthy. He has made us holy. He has made us unreprovable and unblameable before God. We could not accomplish this through keeping the law, or through our works or efforts. That's why he had to come and pay the price, because otherwise we would not have been acceptable. But he did, and he paid the price. And he has become, the Bible says, the propitiation, we'll talk more about that later, for our sins, and he has reconciled us to God. We all of us had sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, just like Adam and Eve, were driven out of the garden and couldn't get back in. You and I had made the wrong choices and we were separated from God and couldn't get back in until Jesus became the door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He became the way for us ostracized on the outside alienated enemies, I'm quoting Ephesians now, to get back inside and to be presented to him holy, unblameable, unreprovable. The devil will tell you it ain't so. It ain't so. He's a liar. And the Lord has done it for all who will accept it. Do do you accept that he has made you righteous? made you holy, made you unblameable, (laughs) unreprovable. My, my, it sounds too good to be true, but it is true. And if you'll accept it, the truth will make you free from condemnation, shame, guilt. One of the biggest errors among religious-minded folks is salvation through effort. Salvation through effort. That we, you know, that when our life is over, people have this, even this idea about that you will meet maybe Peter or whoever at the pearly gates And then your deeds will be weighed in the balance of justice. Your evil deeds on one side, your good deeds on the other. And if you have enough good deeds in the good deed basket, Peter goes, that was close, but come on in. (laughs) This has nothing to do with reality. This is not the Bible. This is not the Word. If you're counting on that, you will be lost. 
I know that's a hard word, but it's the Bible word. Jesus said there's a broad way that leads to destruction, and there's many that are going down that path. And there's all these ideas about that being good will save you and doing good works will save you. But you cannot make yourself acceptable to God through your deeds. That's why if you could do it, then Jesus' coming was unnecessary. But we could not do it. We could not accomplish it. We couldn't save ourselves. Which is why God sent his son to take our place and to be judged in our place. And the Bible said, in fact, go to 2 Corinthians, if you would, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 17. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's how you became holy. You didn't earn it. He just made you that way inside. And uh, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Keep going. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We're to tell everybody that will listen that God will do the same thing for them. They don't have to be outside. They don't have to be alienated from God. They don't have to be counted unrighteous because of their failures and mistakes. Verse 20, now then we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he made him to be sin for us. Did Jesus commit sin? No. Did he deserve punishment for sin? No. Did he deserve judgment? No. But he took it. He became sin and he took the judgment. Why? He, he was made sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We didn't earn righteousness. We received it. By faith. By faith. Praise, God. Praise God. I want you to say out loud, the blood of the Lamb has made me righteous. Has made me acceptable to God. Has made me, has made me holy. Has made me holy. Unblameable. Unblameable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Unreproachable. Unreproachable. Are we reading the scriptures or not? Yes. It takes faith to accept this. But this is how you're, how you're saved, not by works. Now, we'll be rewarded for good works, but that's not what you're saved by. Hmm? And if you've received him and you're trusting in what he did for your salvation, you don't have to wait to find out if you'll be saved or not. You are right now. Your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, according to the Scriptures. Anybody happy about that, Ed? at all. Go to the book of Hebrews. Just a few verses to read to you. We'll shout about it and we can go home. But when I say a few verses, I mean maybe a chapter or two. But just talking about reading them. The book of Hebrews is an amazing revelation on the things we're talking about. It, it takes the Old Testament and the New, and it explains them, and how the one flows into the other, and how the, the New is a continuation uh, of what was described in the Old, and how that what happens in Christ is a fulfillment in reality in heaven of what was portrayed on the earth in Moses and the sacrifices. If you haven't read it carefully, it's well worth your time to take it and just read through it carefully and might want to read it in some different translations. Uh, sometimes the King James is not the way we, we speak. I like the King James, but the phrases you have to sometimes look them up. That won't hurt you either though, will it? 
But I, let's read this in the NIV in Hebrews chapter 8. And this is a real short chapter. But I may just read the whole chapter. And I may just keep going. <laughs> Do you want to understand what happened at the cross? How is it that you became made holy? Hebrews 8, are you there? NIV. And just, just keep, keep the verses up there. I'm just going to read right through them. I may not stop. Verse 1. He said the point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. He was talking about the priesthood that was established uh, under Moses. Who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord and by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. This is talking about Jesus. For there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle he said, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. You understand there are chapters of detail about how the tabernacle was to be constructed and all the articles and then how they, the, the operation of the sacrifices and offerings. And according to this, all of that was a natural example of what actually exists in heaven. It was a physical replica of the actual thing in heaven. Keep going. But the ministry of Jesus that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. It's founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with it and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Uh, it'll not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. They, they, they perished in the wilderness. This is the covenant. I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Hallelujah. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they'll all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. This is one of the things that, that makes our covenant so great. Uh, not just a couple of people that have the anointing on them, but all of us can know him. Hallelujah, personally, from the least to the greatest. Uh, verse 12, I'll forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By calling the covenant new, he's made the first obsolete. What is obsolete in aging will soon disappear. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. I'm just going to keep reading. Is that okay? A tabernacle was set up. In the first room was the lampstand, the table, the consecrated bread. This is the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant, the Ark that contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. We cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry, out, carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. The presence of God was manifest in the inner part, in the holy of holies. And the 
average person could not go in there. The only person that could go in was the high priest, and that only once a year, and that after the sacrifices. And this says, this portrayed that, act, that, that people did not have access to the throne of God. As long as this was happening. But uh, verse, verse 9. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a matter of food and drink and ceremonial washings. External regulations applying to the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest, did you notice only the high priest could go in? <laughs> when Christ came as a high priest of good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For us. Do you remember when he was raised from the dead and the women saw him the very first and he said, don't touch me. They were going to fall down and touch him and worship his, touch his feet. He said, don't touch me because I haven't yet ascended. Well, what was he about to do? He was about to do what had been portrayed at the tabernacle and the temple for centuries. But instead of going into the pattern and replica, he's going in to the actual Holy of Holies in heaven as high priest. And he's not taking animal blood. He's taking his own blood into the Holy of Holies, the place between the mercy, on the mercy seat between the cherubim. And placed his blood there. And the Bible said his blood speaks better things than Abel's. Cain killed Abel. And the Lord said Abel's blood cried out from the ground for what? For justice. To, to, to be, you know, avenged or for justice. And so Abel's blood cried guilty. He's guilty. But you know what? Jesus' blood is saying something else. Jesus' blood is saying, innocent, innocent. They are, all that believe in it, are innocent. Why are we talking about this? Because that is the only thing that would fix the enmity and the animosity between man and God. We couldn't go in there. We couldn't come into the presence of God. We weren't okay. All had sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he took our sin, was made sin with our sin, was judged for it, then rose, hallelujah, from the dead, took his own blood, just like the high priest had done for so many years, went into the holy of holies, and his blood and his offering and his ministration as high priest was accepted by the Father as the propitiation and payment for our sin. One definition of it is ransom in full. Another word for redemption. It appeased the Father. It satisfied Him concerning all the sin and stuff we had done. He saw that, He received that, and He satisfied with us. Hallelujah. No amount of works we can do can add to that. Nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable would have been acceptable. Keep reading this. Let's, let's, let's keep, keep going. Verse, verse 13. He, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were unclean would sanctify them. Uh, so that they're outwardly clean. Verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, that we may lead the, serve rather the, the living God. The, the blood of animals couldn't cleanse the conscience. It could only cover the sin. And it was remembrance of the sin was made again the next year when the offerings were made again, and it was just covered, covered. People even say the wrong thing now in church. Thank God my sins are covered. No, honey child, your sins are not covered. They are washed away. They are cleansed because the blood of Jesus is far greater than any animal blood. And his blood doesn't just cover your sin, it cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Oh, does anybody accept this? Do you, do you accept this? Do you receive this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 15, keep going, keep going. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom, and that's that word, that, that full ransom, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Just keep going. In the case of a will, it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody's died, it never takes effect while the one who made it's living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood out of the tabernacle everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or remission. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these and better blood than animal blood. Keep going. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know he's still there at the right hand of majesty where he ever lives to make intersection for you? That's part of what this is talking about. Verse 25, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that's not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hallelujah. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Anybody in here waiting for him? Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. It would do us a world of good. Just keep reading this and read the rest of the 10th chapter too. Because it, it is so powerful. It, it, it is describing what happened in heaven itself that God had been portraying by what happened in the tabernacle and temple for centuries. But what is this? The scripture says in 1 John and in Romans and other places that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. This is how we were reconciled. He entered in to the holy of holies. Not, not the replica on the ground, but the real thing in heaven. And he was both high priest and sacrifice. He was high priest, but he brought as the sacrifice his own blood. Hallelujah. And offered that blood for our sins to the Father because we were alienated from him because of our sins and shortcomings and failures and rebellions and disobediences and we couldn't fix it. 
through our works, through our efforts, we couldn't fix it. But praise God, we have a great high priest passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Hallelujah. And he paid the price, and the Father accepted the sacrifice of his own Son for our sins, and now he is satisfied with us. He has accepted us in the Beloved, and we are reconciled at one again with Him. Do you believe it, child of God? Stand on your feet, everybody.